morning, everyone. My name is Don Martinez. Um, I'm a Goat Club leader at RHS. Uh, wow, well, Pastor Nick already said it. And all this. Okay. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, Numbers uh, chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. Uh, now the people complained about their hardships and the hearing of the Lord. And when they heard them, his anger was aroused. Then the fire of, uh, from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of their outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and he the fire down, died down. So that the place was called Talbrith? Give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> because fire from the Lord had burned among them. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israel, Israelites started uh, wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. He remembered the fish. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. And also <laughs> the cucumbers, melons, leeks, Onion, onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We have never seen anything but this mayana. They got that how you pronounce it. Yeah. The mayana was considered like a corner seed and looked like reason. The people went around gathering it and then the ground it had it in a hand mill or crushed in a motor. They cooked it in a pot or made it in loaves, and it tasted like something made with olive oil. When the drew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put on put the burden of all these people on me? Uh, Go ahead, skip. Yeah. Uh, Numbers chapter 11, 18 through 20. Tell the people, concentrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow. When you will start, when you will eat meat, the Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it just eat it just for a day, one day, or two days, or even five, or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and your lord. <laughs> I can't pronounce that word. Sorry. Um, it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have well before him, saying, why do we ever leave Egypt? Numbers chapter 11, 31 through 34. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in, from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits deep around the camp. Also, Far also as a day do day's walk in any direction, all that the day and night, and all the next day, the people went out to gather quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Then spread them uh, spread them all around around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed. The anger of the Lord burned against the people and have struck in them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kabrith Havada. I can't pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they've, they burned the people who have cra craved other food. All right. This is the word of the Lord. Give them a hand. You're good. Take, take the mic. It's not easy being up here, you know. But thank you, Adon. Appreciate it. 
So, you know, I love seeing you guys pull out your Bibles. It's one of the most important things is for you to read the Word of God, for you to see what God's trying to speak to you today, what pops off the page. I believe he still moves that way. And that's why we do this, is uh, for us to have the Word be spoken between God and you uh, into your life, for you to read and see uh, just what God wants to do and speak to you today. And so uh, we're starting our new series, Wandering Lost in Faith. Uh, you know, everybody just keeps asking, Nick, we really need to do the book of Numbers, and um, so, fine, if we must, I know it's everybody's favorite. Uh, no, you know, there's some really good stuff in the book of Numbers, but one of the pieces we're going to look at is we're going to look at the life of Israel, and you know, they're entering this place where they just organized this faith in God, where they just became his people. They went through all these miracles. God's driving them to the promised land. And this is such an important piece of the whole Bible, is that God is constantly saying, I've got this grand promise of what you're going to be to me in relationship to me, of what you're going to mean to the world, and what I'm going to do through you is going to change the world. And so he's moving them towards this promise. But they have to walk through a desert. To get out of slavery, they have to walk through a desert. To get to the promised land, they've got to struggle. They've got to fight. And I think these are super important because they're not just old historic stories. This is kind of the storyline of the Bible, and it is certainly the storyline of our faith. It still reflects our life together as we are as believers as a church. Um, you know, Paul says... Uh, I believe it was in 1 Corinthians, Paul goes as far to say that the experiences, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, the experiences of Israel, uh, were they suffered and they struggled and they failed so that we could learn from them and not do the same. That we can learn about what faith looks like in relationship to God and what we need in Christ to be able to struggle through the desert. You know, Israel was saved by God out of Egypt. Hopefully you've seen the Prince of Egypt. If you don't read your Bible, it's, a, it's pretty accurate. Um, there's ten plagues. There's all these miracles God does to, res to get them out of slavery. He gives them the vision of the promised land. And we still have a similar journey. When we come to know Christ, God offers free grace to free us out of our bondage to sin. He still takes us out of slavery, and he still has a great promise of eternal salvation. But not just that, he also has a promise that you can enter in and be a part of his kingdom to be under his leadership and lordship and his power. He still promises you that if you submit yourself to him as part of your life, that he is going to make you a great people, that you will do great things in this world and find salvation in Christ. Like he still has this promise that if you get free from sin, I'm going to take you to places you can never imagine. And yet, part of that promise that we don't like to talk about is there will be a desert in the middle of that. There will be times in which you are hungry, in which you are thirsty, in which you are struggling, in which you want to quit. Anybody been there? Good, then this sermon's for you and me. You know, just like Israel, we've accepted Jesus, we get excited, we love the miracle, or however you came to Christ, it feels good, we love the promises, but, but we hit these deserts, these, these broken parts of our path, the sin that creeps up, the things that make us forget God. We lose vision, we lose hope sometimes. And most importantly, what we're going to address today is we lose our hunger for God. We lose a hunger, our craving, our need to desire God, to run after him. And this is what is wandering. Like, wandering's fine. I like to wander around sometimes and daydream. But when wandering turns into running in circles, going nowhere for 40 years... When wandering means that you don't get to go into what pro God has promised you, when wandering means that all your relationships are being broken because you're moving nowhere with God, that's not healthy wandering. And this is what we see in the life of Israel. You know, we, the thing about this is it's important, to, it's, not just a, it's not about people who are on the outside of church or who don't know Christ, it's about y'all who say, I know Christ, but you feel kind of stuck. Anybody stuck? You feel flat. You feel like you've just been kind of doing this Christian thing in circles for a while. Lacking a direction or a passion. I just don't feel passionate about God anymore. You know, I hear it all the time. I've walked through it personally. 
And in fact, I would go as far to say at any given time, this is probably the majority experience for people, so you're not alone. That this is where we find ourselves. So today we're going to look at how we lose our hunger for God based in Numbers 11. How do we lose our hunger for God? Why does this occur? How does it happen? I hope this is a challenge for you today. I hope this resonates. If you've ever felt stranded, let's, let's listen closely. So in chapters 11 in Numbers, we read about Israel coming to this place and they're complaining and grumbling about God. I know that's not a y'all, but you've got to just stick with the story. All right? Um, they complain about their leaders. I'm so glad it's not a y'all, uh, but just let's follow the story. They complain about not having enough. They complain about uh, their fear where, where they're heading. And God has done all these things. As I said, man, he, he sent these plagues. He splits the Red Sea. I mean, this is the grandiose stories of their life, their experience. He saved them from the Egyptian armies. He rained down manna from heaven. He brought water from a rock when they were thirsty. I mean, he has shown them miracle and after miracle. And then when you get into numbers, the place we find them is, this is after they've encountered God on Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were brought. And they actually couldn't even get close to him because the presence and the power of God was so strong, but he showed his presence to Moses, and he entered, and he came down to be with the people. I mean, it was a miraculous and crazy experience that we can't even fathom, and what happens is they go, God, uh, man, I, we will obey whatever you say. They are so enthralled by God. They're just like, this is so amazing. We are his children. Amen. We will do whatever you say. We're going to do everything you say, and we will obey is what they said and then three days later um, they're in the wilderness again they go they said we're going to go to the promised land we're going to be your people we're going to listen we're going to go after you and like literally every time there's a miracle it takes about three days for them to go but things aren't working now And so here's what we read. You've got to listen closely to what they're saying here because I think it does echo us a lot. They said, basically, at first, I am tired of the desert. Anybody tired of the desert? But you know what's worse than that? You can be tired of the desert. Everybody would hate the desert. That's not bad. But what's worse than that, what comes next is, I am tired of manna. They said, we want to go back to Egypt. See, here's what they said. If only we had meat to eat. See, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. If you didn't catch that, at no cost, they were in rugged slavery where they cried out to God because of how terrible their life was. But here they are saying, we had leeks. I don't even know what leeks are. It must have been good. They had melons and onions and garlic. It sounds like something you cook. (laughs) They had fish. At no cost. I mean, this is crazy. It cost them their whole life. It cost them their freedom. They had no God. They were just enslaved. And they're like, man, those were the good old days. They remember how Egypt was much better. See, uh, they were hungering and thirsting after Egypt's food, but not God's food. That's one of the first things we've got to look at. This is one reason why you and I do not have a hunger for God, and I hope you're paying attention. May you have ears to hear this morning. It's the palate of our past. This is when we romanticize the lives we've lived before God. That's not Pilates for those who like to work out. Um... That is palate. And here's what I mean by that. Is sometimes we talk about wanting God, but in fact our tastes and our desires for things haven't changed. And we romanticize them. We look back on our life before God, and we haven't really like disliked what we were eating back then. We didn't dislike how we lived back then. We didn't hate it. You know, it was actually pretty good. So we're kind of going after God. We're, we're kind of moving towards that direction. We're, we're Christians. But you know what? I kind of like the food better 
the past better than, and so we romanticize it. Man, remember how good that was? And you forget the, when you romanticize, you forget all the negative parts of it. So here, Israel completely neglects the part that they're dispossessed by the Egyptians and all they, and they're in slavery and all they remember is the leaks, you know. And that's not unlike us. If you've never came to hate the bondage of sin, if it was just kind of something you know theoretically is not good, then you probably will end up not really following that for very long. And you're probably not going to end up following his leading. You're probably not going to be excited about the things he wants to provide for you because, you know, they're not quite what you enjoyed back then. I used to, I often ask people if they tell me, I, I talk to people all the time and I'm, I sympathize because I have walked through struggles of faith. I continue to walk through struggles of faith. But they're going, man, that maybe they have addictions, maybe they have things. They just talk about their cycles and they go, I just keep trying and I keep falling back. I keep trying and I keep doing this again. And I look at them, I go, do you hate what you're doing? Like, you know, Nick, I'm smoking weed. Okay, do you hate it? I want to quit. Okay, do you hate it? Nick, I keep getting drunk. Okay, but do you hate it? Like, you know, it, when we finally change, and fortunately the reality for us is we get to that place in our life where we've ruined our families, we've lost our spouses, our kids dislike us, we've hurt somebody in the process, and we go, now I hate it. Now it is really awful, but if unfortunately if we haven't hit that rock bottom yet, we don't quite hate it. In fact, it was kind of fun. You know, have you ever heard somebody tell their testimony? It's like, man, I used to be so drunk. And, and it's like bragging. And you just go, well, you used to be, and you probably will be again because you're bragging about it. Like it was so awesome because it hasn't yet ruined everything for you. You know, and that's the thing, we romanticize this stuff. You know, we can, I can romanticize my past and go, man, it was so fun when I was, you know, single and, you know, I, had, I was drinking. And, but you know what you forget about? The lonely nights. The fact that I had no friends that gave two rips about anything about my life. You know, the fact that my uh, relationships were always strained. You know, you, you romanticize the past and you forget about the fact that it was, it was slavery. It was bondage with some good leeks and onions. <laughs> See, we don't seem to make the connection that a lot of times the things we thought were awesome were actually the reasons we were so broken. We were so insecure. We were so needy. We stayed with spouses or, pe or girlfriends or boyfriends we shouldn't have because we were so broken. So if you find yourself feeling like you are wandering in the wilderness and you're not hungering for God, perhaps it's because you aren't actually wanting what he is offering or seeing where he is leading because you actually never gave up your affections for Egypt. The next thing we see is also telling. The Israelites in their complaining say, we no longer have an appetite for this stuff God is giving us. We no longer have an appetite. We, this is what they said. We never see anything but this manna. Now, I think anybody who's eaten a lot of the same meals, if you're, uh, I don't know, if your spouse isn't gifted in that area or something, um, I, don't under, I don't know how that feels, but, <laughs> but, you know, if you eat the same things over and over again, Taco Bell, <laughs> that's not food, uh, you get to this point, you're just like, ugh, I've had this before, right? But here's the thing about manna that we've got to look at. Manna was a bread-like substance that God somehow rained down from the sky. But manna's not just bread. If you read further, it goes into detail, and it's not just useless. What the scripture, what Numbers is trying to tell you is it says that manna was like seed that they were able to cook with, they were able to make into loaves. Uh, Exodus tells us it tasted like honey, and the psalmist in Psalm 78 tells us that God rained down manna that was like bread from heaven. It was the bread of angels. It was the grain of heaven. Like literal miraculous food that was fit for angels. 
And in spite of all this, it says, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, his miracles, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility. Now, here's my point. It's not just a common food staple that you get tired of like we do when we eat something. We're talking about a miraculous food. We're talking about food from heaven. And all they said to it is, all we ever get is this stuff. We, all we get is this stuff. See, this is a major reason you and I begin wandering and become lost in our faith. Why we feel stuck. Why we're not moving forward. It's the monotony of manna. We get bored of God. We get bored of God. And the longer you've been a Christian, the safer you've been as a Christian, the more you've, your well-being you've had as a Christian, the more likely we are. It's the great curse of a free society. Because you don't really have to work for it. It's not hard to come by. Nobody tells you you can't. You've got 20 Bibles in your house that you haven't dusted off in years. Right? You come to church, it's cool. I mean, we've got a nice church. It's easy. And so, you know, I mean, it's manna. Perhaps your parents took you to church for your whole life. Maybe you went to camps. You know what we're dealing with here, y'all? We're dealing with salvation and eternity and and the wonders of the world and, and the great meaning of life and the purpose God has for every single individual in this room. I mean, it is the miraculous thing. It is the most miraculous thing you can ever imagine what we get to deal with and live in in our faith. And how do we treat it? See, God has given us salvation by grace alone. And in spite of all the wondrousness of God's word, we have had it and we are kind of bored by it. I've done this. I've did the Bible study. I've heard the story. You know, just as Israel said, all I get is this bread from heaven. What was once miraculous is now just common and boring to them. I mean, think about that. I want that to stick. What was once miraculous is now common and boring. They are used to God's wonders. And we do this too. I want you to think about something. We have, everybody got a Bible on your phone, on your app, in your chair, perhaps? Let me tell you about the Bible. I, I try not to be a Bible thumper, but listen, to, listen, think about the Bible. There is absolutely, this is not hyperbole, 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 <laughs> hyperbole. <laughs> uh, there is nothing like the Bible in, in, the, in the history of the world. And let me tell you why. It was written over multiple millennia by 40 plus different authors on three different continents in multiple different languages. It was written, you know, in different cultural contexts. And yet it has been applicable to every culture on every society in every period of time in some way, shape, or form. It has caused a complete social reformation. I mean, there is absolutely nothing like the Word of God. And Jesus Christ says, not only is He the Word of God, that He is the Word, and the Word is of God, and the Word is in God, but that the, that, that the prophets and the authors have actually been inspired by God to give us the Word of God, the wisdom of God that is fully known in Jesus, but is elaborated in the Scriptures. It is a wondrous, wondrous thing, and most of us go, ah, if I get to it. I don't know, it's a little boring. It's kind of like the same old thing over and over again. I guess we should read it. I mean, we're in a desert. Or maybe we sit and worship. We come here, we gather here. I mean, I just love y'all. I mean, this diverse body of people, it's just amazing. And we get this, I mean, there's no place like this in the country where 
this many different people come together and we, and we coalesce to support and encourage and challenge and we worship God and, it, and the scriptures say wherever two or three, how about 350 are gathered that the spirit of God is at work. The spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is at work within this place right now, right here amongst us, that he is working to renew people's souls, that he is working to bring eternity into your life, that he is working to heal people, to find hope in, in lost situations where you feel hopeless. I mean, the Spirit of God is at work, and we come to worship, and we go, eh. I mean, I mean, the, I mean, it's not my style. Where's the hymnals? You know, like miracles from heaven. And there's just manna. It's just some bread. I guess I should go to church this month. See, the reason you and I often, if you're sitting here, and this is a loving challenge, if you're sitting here and you've been sitting there asking, why do I keep just kind of cycling, not moving forward in my faith? Just ask yourself these questions. Do you really appreciate the, gr the grand mystery and miraculousness of, of what we get to do here and what God is teaching in the word of God? If you, if you don't, if you just feel like it's the same thing, if you're just saying, ah, bread from heaven again, <laughs> then that might be why you're wandering, because that's certainly why Israel was. They got lost in those things. See, what I see here is sometimes what God is wanting to do through you, what he is wanting to speak to you, the wonders he is wanting to show you and do in you and do through you is right in front of you. See, the manna was right in front of them. The miracle of God, all they had to look and go, hey, this is kind of crazy, this stuff rains down in bread-like fashion. It's right in front of us sometimes. And we keep praying for answers and wisdom and direction. And he's like, I already dropped wisdom from heaven in the Bible and you keep wondering what you should do. It's miraculous. And it continues to be somehow, some way God takes what we do here, how we worship, how, what we say, what you read, and he speaks to you at where you're at at that moment and sometimes somehow does that with 20, 30, 40 other people. All in different places. Like it's miraculous. And so we pray for support and help in our time of need. And he's already like, I've already worked these things together. There's already somebody in this church who is going through the same thing that I want to connect you with. Are you looking? Like it's, those are miracles. It's right in front of us sometimes. And I just don't consider it a miracle anymore. My children, my spouse, are often God's gifts to me. And we just don't see them as God's wonders all the time. They're just, oh, this again. I've seen God do some really big miracles in my life, like really awesome things. And here's what I'm here to tell you that is actually, though, the daily provisions of how I just see him do the right thing at the right time with the right word from the right person. That has been how I know I'm assured of his love the most. In the last part of this chapter, we have a pretty grisly ending. <laughs> the Israelites say, we don't want miracle bread. We want meat. Meat was a luxury. They say, we want luxury. We crave new flavors. We want it more. We want more in abundance. I want it better. I want it nicer. I want it bigger. I want it more. So God gives them it. Sometimes y'all keep going, oh, God blessed me with this or that. I go, <laughs> yeah, and he's about to bless them with quail. Let's read the rest of the story. God sends quail by the bushels through the encampment. And if they were us, they'd be going, look it, God blessed us. God blessed me with stuff. Yes, no, what he did is he said, fine, have what you want. Let's see how that worked out for you. And this is what he says, fine, you want Egypt, you want luxurious bird meat, fine, here it is. 
And I'm not only going to give you it for today, I'm going to give it to you for a whole month. Now, for my prosperity gospelers, you're like, amen. Keep reading. Until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. And the scriptures tell us, actually, that that is exactly what happened, that they craved more and more. They craved greater and greater and richer and richer and, and better food until they got sick. Until they were so full they got ill. Until they contracted a plague for many of them. You know, this is in, in many ways is why we never move forward in our faith. And we wander in it. It's the glut of our guts. We spend our days seeking fulfillment beyond God. Seeking being filled by all things but God. And we wonder why I'm moving nowhere with God. The reason I don't have an appetite for God is because I'm too busy chasing other appetites. It's really not a crazy mystery. I don't have an appetite because my appetites are for, for other things. And they're very different. You know, it's like having, if you're like a sweet tooth and all you eat is junk and then somebody tries to make you eat vegetables to get healthy. You don't have an appetite for it. Because your palate's not adjusted to it. You don't want it. Here's the thing to pay attention to. God was already being generous. He promised to provide for them for the whole journey until they reached the promised land where he was going to bless them in immensely, make them a nation beyond all nations that all others would look to, that he, they would call him ble them blessed. I mean, they were going to be glorified amongst other nations, and he was going to provide bread for every day that they needed, just enough as they needed to be able to do what he has called them to. Like, that's, that's abundant blessing. And all he says is, you're going to have to trust me. But if you follow my lead, if you enjoy the manna and, and understood what the whole point of the food was, the whole point of the food was to provide for the journey. Like it wasn't for you to like love it. It was for you to have enough sustenance to get to where God is trying to lead you. That you wouldn't die of starvation, that God would be faithful. And he says, you'll be blessed and mightily and you'll be a light of the world, and the whole world's going to be redeemed through you if you'll just keep going and use food as fuel, not as the end game. But instead, they didn't just eat to live for the sake of God. They lived to eat. Like they lived to fill themselves up. Their main aim became about getting filled with better and better and more and more. Uh, this is probably the first obesity issue in an epidemic. I'm just kidding. Probably not. But, you know, I mean, it, it resonates. One major reason we are often not moving along in our faith and sometimes feel lost is because we're too full. Either we can't move because we're too fat, or we don't want to because if I move, it means I'm not getting what I want here. I'm not gathering as much manna and quail as I can. If I'm on the move, I don't got time to just keep stacking and keeping and keeping. I'm, I'm on the move. Our bellies are full, so we don't really need God's daily bread, do we? Our time is full because we're trying to get more and more, so we really don't have time to see what God is wanting to do in us and through us and lead us. Like, everything's full. My time is full. My belly is full. My mind is full. I'm full of it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God provides not so I can get fat off his provisions, but so that I can do his work and follow him and fight the good fight and change the world around me. See, Israel hoped for the riches of Egypt rather than the kingdom of God. Sit with that. What they wanted, they didn't care about the slavery, they wanted the riches of Egypt. They didn't care that they were worked to the bone 80, 90 hours a week. Anybody? Because they wanted the riches of Egypt. They didn't care that it was slavery, that they didn't have relationships, that their children were being killed, that whatever was going on. They didn't care. They wanted the riches of Egypt, not the kingdom of God. So if you haven't grown in your faith in a long time, consider this. 
Maybe you and I are craving the promise of the kingdom of America rather than the kingdom of God. Maybe that's what we're after. We don't care if it's slavery. We don't care if it rips our families apart because it's so good. Onions, leeks, bananas, teal. What is it? How's it go? If your comfortability of your lifestyle has filled you up so much that you can't imagine being uncomfortable amongst the poor, that you can't imagine being radically generous, that you can't imagine taking risks for God to serve people that would be odd for you, then you and I are probably missing the mission God has for us because we're so full. If we're so comfortable that we can't imagine God doing wild and crazy things in our lives to serve others, then we don't really have our sights on the promised land. We don't, that's the kingdom of God. It doesn't just mean in the hereafter going to heaven somewhere. It means what God wants to see done through you, around you, where his presence and his power is felt because of how you live. Because of how you live, he wants to see his kingdom of God come to earth as it is in heaven. And we don't want to because it's not comfortable. It never will be. So the more comfortable I am, the, least, the less I want that. That's why our tagline here is get uncomfortable. If you're new to this church, welcome. <laughs> That's our tagline. Get uncomfortable. The enemy of our faith journey and the radical thing God is planning to do with you already is the glut of our gut. It's the comfortability of our fullness. In Psalm 106, the psalmist shares about this episode in the wilderness. I'm going to read it from the King James Version. Just because I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting phrase. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request. But he sent leanness, leanness into their soul. You, you understand what it's saying? You got filled, but your soul got leaner. You got fatter, but your soul dwindled. They were full in their stomachs, but their souls were empty. Perhaps that's you and I today. Other translations like the NIV, NIV says that they were sent a wasting disease. I thought that was an interesting phrase too. See here, God frees us from slavery, provides phenomenal miracles, promises them that he will bless them abundantly if they just follow and trust him. But you know what the unfortunate, I'm going to, this spoiler alert for all of you who are just chomping to go read numbers. Um, <laughs> here's the unfortunate story, is that this generation who was promised the promised land to be a light for God's people, to, to be the ancestry that then sets the tone for the Messiah who would redeem the whole world, they never get in. They never go. They didn't hunger for God, and they spent the rest of their lives in the desert, wandering around in circles, going nowhere, wasting away. Their stomachs were full, but they were wasting away. They just sat in a desert. Forty years when they were on the edge of what God had promised them. We'll get into more of that in the coming weeks. But that's what I call a wasting disease. You were made for this amazing, heroic, miraculous purpose. Every single one of you, I don't care who you are, some way, somehow, God uses every single person to do phenomenal things when they give themselves for that purpose. And we have that ingrained in us. And if we aren't going after that, we are wasting away. I mean, we're wasting the promises of God. We're wasting the miraculous that he wants to do through you and that's a wasting disease. They became bored by God and never let go of Egypt in their hearts. They became bored. <laughs> they became bored by God. And don't ever tisk tisk Israel. It's us. The psalmist also says in Psalm seventy eight. I read this once, but I think it's important. In spite of his wonders, they did not believe. 
so he ended their days in futility. This word wonders means miracles. In spite of raining down wonders in their life, they didn't count them wonderful. So they ended their days in futility. You know that word futility is used throughout the Bible. It means meaninglessness. It means they, their days ended dying in a desert. And that's never what God intended. And for the vast majority of us, family, many of us are going to spend the rest of our lives in a desert of work and, and production and, and money and just deserts, 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 and we're never going to take the risk. We're going to die in the desert. As long as we got leeks and onions, we're good. God's promises and God's miracles were right in front of them, but they did not wonder in them, it says. If you've come to that place where you don't feel like you have direction or growth or you're just numb to God, then one of the major things we learn from all of this is that like Israel, the reason we wander is because we have lost our wonder. The reason we wander is because we have lost our wonder. Here's what I mean. God has done miracles in your life whether you think you've seen them or not. They, they got to see big miracles. They got to see small ones, but they failed to be in awe of God. They failed to remember the freedom and the promises he gave them, the salvation that he has led them to. They failed to remember his great and mighty hand holding them as children. They failed to remember. They weren't in awe of it. They weren't amazed by it anymore. It's just, you know, it's God. He does things like that. It's manna. Miracle bread dropping from the sky. Ah, oh, not this again. You know, Romans 1, Paul says this. He says, he says, the root of sin, the root of sin is not glorifying in God. Here's what that means. Glory is not a word we use a lot. It means I don't look at God and just go, wow, you are the most important thing. I can't believe the way you moved here. I can't believe the blessings you have given me. I can't believe, like, I'm just in awe of your hand on my life. And when you lose that wonder, that is the root of your sin life, and that is the root of your wasting disease. That's what Paul is getting at in Romans 1. This is not a joke, I promise. Uh, this was something I was really thinking about. It's like having a spouse who cooks for you each night, as mine does. She cooks for the family. And I get to sit with my kids on all nights that aren't church night. And I get to have dinner with my five awesome kids, you know. And, and, I, and my wife gets home from work and gets all the weird stuff and puts it all together into a nice meal and we eat together, and it would be the equivalent, which is not unheard of. I mean, I wouldn't ever do this, but it's not unheard of that we would complain about the food. And here's what I'm saying by that. It's like we're complaining about the food, but what's right in front of me? A woman who comes and slaves away in the kitchen after work so that her family can sit together, that I get to sit with my kids, that I get to see their faces each day, that I get this beauty and this short time I have with them. Like that's the miracle. And I'm complaining about the food. Israel craved their past desires in Egypt. They lost their awe and love and excitement about being God's chosen people. They lost the awe of being in a relationship with a God I shouldn't even be able to approach. So instead of moving forward and being a part of something that truly changed the world and the lives of future generations, they died in a desert, full in their stomachs and empty in their souls. Don't let your faith become like that. 
It is time for us to start seeking to be full of wonder again, like when we were little kids. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When you were full of wonder, seeing miracles and the promises of God with those types of hopes and dreams. It's time to be wonderful. Time to be wonderful. Time to be filled with wonder again. It sounds like one of those fluffy sermons, huh? Be wonderful. This is about as close as I get. Be wonderful. Be filled with awe. Take the time to stop and think about how crazy and coincidental so many things are in our lives that the right person calls you at the right time, that your life is even given to you on each given day. Be filled with wonder. And you know the only way we can do that, it, it's easy to go home and say, I'm just going to make a list and, and think of all the things that are wonderful. I'm not telling you to do that. That won't last. The only way to be filled with wonder again is to set our eyes on Christ. It's to understand our faith in Christ. It's to dwell in that. It's to make that a part of our everyday ministry. It's to make that a part of our everyday breathing and living and eating. It's to say, God, what am I to do for you today? What are you going to do through me today? What do you want to teach me today? And to stand in awe of what God is doing. And to stop making this a side thing. It's to stop making the promised land like something in the far off future. They were only freaking like a year away. They were only like this little, little while away from the promised land and they stopped looking at it and they started looking at manna. It's to stop looking at manna and start looking at Christ and you can't get there and be in wonder and, and hear his voice and be sent into the promised land and to see him conquer and to see him pour water from rocks. He says, I am the water that was in the wilderness. He says, if you're thirsty, come to me. If you're hungry, I'm the bread. That's what Jesus Christ said. We can't just keep putting him to the side. It has to be the central vision. And as we listen, as we hear, as we pray, as we go with him, it's wonderful. You'll be filled with wonder again. There's no other way. You'll see the wonder of the cross, which the mysteries, I, I, I've studied it, I've taught it, I, the mysteries still continue to confound me of the wondrousness of the cross. The wonder of redemption, the wonder of the, ho the Holy Spirit. If you don't know Christianity, good, because this should weird you out, it's amazing. But if you do, it's, you get so comfortable, but the idea that the Spirit of God is within me, If you've accepted that and it doesn't make you go, what? It doesn't feel like it. I don't act like it. Oh, but it's there. The wonder of the fact that God says, my spirit is with you. I am always with you. My power is at work in you. And that's when you begin to find your way again. That's how you get out of a desert. You recognize that the power of God is right in front of me. The miracles of God are standing in my kitchen. That the miracles of God have led me this way, have provided for me, has never failed to provide. And that's when we stop craving the food of slaves. That's when we stop being bored of the gifts of God. That's when we stop seeking other appetites that we think will fill us because Christ begins to fill us. Because we start to see that my sustenance is not in what I eat today, what I gain today, but will be in the journey of getting to the promised land with God, not just in eternity, but that means spending time in his presence starting now and being fully enveloped in his presence. It's to wonder in the word of God. It's to wonder in the Holy Spirit. It's to wonder that this many weird people gather together and love one another. Like, it is a wonder, and there's a reason it doesn't happen many places. Because it's a wondrous work of his Holy Spirit. Let's be wonderful. You'll stand with me.
Lord God, I just thank you for this time that we have together, God. I pray that you are honored through it. I pray that our hearts are softened to you. I pray that our minds are open to you. I pray that our ears are open to you. God, I pray that you begin to instruct us with wonder. I, be, I pray that we remember, that we remember what you have done. I pray that you reveal things that we may have just glossed over as normal and just reveal that your hand was in them. Lord God, I pray that we begin to honor you, not with our time and our feet and our praise and our time and our giving. And our Lord, I just pray that we begin to honor you like you are the most central thing of our life, Lord. And God, I pray because uh, your people honor you that you will bless them. Lord God, I pray that because they set aside their cravings for Egypt, that you will bless them with your presence, that you will bless them with your miraculous hand. Lord God, will you make us a people that is pleasing to you, a pleasing aroma, and may our appetites be stirred by that aroma, and may the appetites of others, because they see the lives of Redeemer's people, May they be stirred with an appetite for you. God, I pray that over our congregation. I pray that you move in power. I pray, pray that you begin to break down all these things that make us attached to Egypt, that you strip us of those, that you, that you wet our appetites for you more and more. May your name be honored here. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. May God's grace, peace, and blessing be on you this week.